the first letter written by Peter, chapter number 2. 1 Peter, chapter number 2. Peter says in verse 1, reading down through verse number 3, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And like newborn infants, not immature babies or not immaturity being the point, but the way that infants long for the sincere milk of their mother. We are to long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation. If indeed... You have tasted that the Lord is good or gracious. Have you tasted that? Okay. Well, as I thought, this is my first time in the pulpit of of 2022 here. And as I thought about what text to preach going into the new year, this particular passage caught my attention. And it caught my attention because it was not only a basic or a fundamental text for the Christian life, it's just sort of the ground zero for the Christian life, but it is also an extremely challenging text to obey. So it's fundamental and basic. It should be something that all of us do, and yet it's challenging because it is so difficult, it seems, for many to... Obey. It's challenging because it talks about or commands us to do something that many Christians, perhaps all Christians, struggle to do. In fact, it commands something that many, if not most, in our churches, whether they articulate it or not, or whether they, whether they consciously think about it or not, they basically think that you can't do this, it's impossible. They do not think it is possible because it commands desire. It commands a longing for something that simply seems out of reach for most. In fact, it commands something that many have no strong inclination for at all. Other desires far outweigh the desire that is can that is commanded in this text, a command to desire the pure spiritual milk, as Peter puts it here. It's a command to desire a spiritual good, but it is a command that is unfortunately often ignored, totally left alone, not given much thought, put down and forgotten. Now, an example of what I mean by other desires competing with the desire for a spiritual good is really found in a familiar passage where Jesus encounters the rich young ruler. And and I'm going to ask us to turn to it in Matthew chapter number 19. Matthew chapter 19, this is Jesus' encounter with the rich young ruler. And in Matthew 19, again, we know much of this story. It's, it's really familiar to us, but let's just look at it again and then make a few comments because what we're looking for is how other desires can squeeze out a spiritual good. So Matthew 19, beginning in verse number 16, and behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you, who, if you would enter life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. 
Honor your father and mother. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All of these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Now, everything about this encounter looks legitimate. The man truly seems to want a spiritual good. He wants eternal life. He comes to the master. He comes to the Lord. He recognizes that he is a good teacher, but also good in essence, even though Jesus tries to correct his thinking into why he's calling him good. But when the man was confronted with the choice between the desire for his riches or the desire for eternal life through Christ and following Christ, he had a stronger craving for his temporal wealth than for following Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now contemplate that for a moment. What became more important to the rich man was his riches more than eternal life. In the Gospel of Mark, you find in Mark 8 and verse 36, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? So here was a man that was willing to give up his soul for the riches that he had. In other words, his desire for lesser things than a spiritual good overcame his desire for a spiritual good. The same kind of exchange, not the particular exchange of wealth for eternal life, but the same kind of exchange of, of a lesser thing for a spiritual good happens to Christians as well. In fact, that's why Peter is addressing the issue here in 1 Peter chapter 2. Apparently, those to whom he was writing were struggling in this area, and he wants to encourage them along to desire the spiritual milk, as he puts it in verse 2. So he exhorts them to pursue this spiritual good of desiring that which, he's, which he talks about in verse 2. And I think at this point, we need to ask a question. We need to ask the question, why? Why is it that professing Christians have such a low desire for spiritually beneficial things? Now, brothers and sisters, most of us have walked with the Lord for a period of time, and most of us know that there have been periods of times or seasons in our lives where our spiritual desires for spiritual good things were low. And not only were, there desires, were our desires low for the spiritual good, but we found that our desires for that which is far lesser in value were sky high. And we've walked and lived that kind of thing. The question is, why do professing Christians have such a low desire for spiritually beneficial things? And again, I remind you, I think that this is a crucial text for us to think about this new year and how we will live it out. Well, let me give you an example. Why are, brothers and sisters, think about it now, why are prayer meetings the least attended activity in so many churches today? Why are prayer meetings? Why is the concept of a corporate gathering of God's people to commune with the living God and offer supplication for one another so poorly attended in most of the churches we know? Why has Sunday night worship service been completely and permanently abandoned by so many churches? Now think, we just talked about this morning how worship was glorious and how blessed we are when we come to worship God. So why, if it's true that our worship of the living God is such a blessedness to us as believers, why do we not 
desire to do it more rather than less. Why are spiritual disciplines, personal Bible reading, memorization, meditation, prayer, discipling, evangelism, why are they exchanged for so many lesser things? Let me give you a sense of why that, uh, of what I'm talking about over in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 58. Flip to it so you can mark it in your mind where we are. Isaiah 58, and beginning at verse 13. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, or seeking your own pleasure, or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So what happens on Sunday evenings? When God's people who used to assemble together to worship God no longer assemble together to worship God. Do they engage in spiritual activities or are they given themselves to pleasure rather than the appointed time of coming to worship God in the evening on Sunday? Brothers and sisters, again, our worship is glorious. Our God is glorious, and our hearts are so blessed by it. Why exchange the spiritual good for a lesser good? I know the issue is not simple. I know that. I know the reasons that are given are myriad, and they're all over the board. I mean, I've heard... I don't know if I've heard all of them. I've heard a lot of them. And I know you, that you've made a decision yourself, and you have reasons for why you do what you do. So you have reasons for your not doing something. I understand that. Nevertheless, in our text in 1 Peter, when it's talking about the spiritual good in verses 1 and 2, our text is still the word of God, and it commands desire. He says, Peter does, like newborn infants, long for the pure milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation. But before we get to the desire being commanded, our text deals with the obstruction of the desire in verse number one. In fact, that obstruction is the connection that we find between verse one and verse two. We find between the put away of verse one and the long for in verse number two. So there are things that Peter indicates that can actually creep into the Christian life that will obstruct the increasing of desire for a spiritual good. Now suppose, for instance, after being challenged to read through the Bible this year, okay? So let's just think, just for a moment, we've heard this over, uh, we heard it two years ago, we heard it last year, we've heard it maybe the year before that, we're hearing it again this year, uh, this, this challenge to read, through the, to, to read through the Bible, we've heard how good that is. We know it's good. In fact, we know it is good, and we keep hearing how good it is, and we keep hearing about the different ones who add that to their things of doing and, and that they are thankful that they've done it, and, and so we know that this is a good thing. Christ, the man. 
And let's suppose after we hear this challenge that we are encouraged to have a resolve to do it. And so we take up the challenge. And the intention that we have is noble because this is a noble thing. The motivation has been increased because, man, every time you come, man, the pastor's talking about it. So every time we come, we hear we should be reading our Bibles or we should be reading through our Bibles. And, and so our motivation is increased and, and you feel a, a spiritual interest within growing. And I would anticipate that that would be true of you because you know the Lord. And so all, you're do, all we're doing is throwing a little fuel on that flame to get it to rise up a little bit more and to become a little bit more heated. And so I'm expecting that as we challenge you in these spiritual good things and you're walking with God, that you're going to want to do those things. So the desire that you have increases. And so you get interested and you want to grow and you get interested in it. And so therefore you plan. And so you set a schedule. You're going to read early in the morning when nothing can interfere, or maybe your plan is something else. I can't read early in the morning, but I'll take my lunch hour, and I'm going to read in my lunch hour. Or, or maybe, maybe you're just a, a really, 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 really late riser, and so your reading is going to be in the evening. But any way you put it, you've planned, and you set a schedule, and you're going to read with complete discipline. But... You get to the book of Leviticus, or you get to the book of Numbers, or you get to some other challenging book, and you're reading it, and you're reading genealogies, or you're just reading name after name, and, and you find as you are in that process, your desire takes a hit. That commitment in your mind, that resolve you had, that interest that was raised up a little bit higher has now taken a hit. And suddenly, suddenly as a result, other things begin to creep in to your Bible reading time slot. And so you were reading the Bible through in the mornings, and all of a sudden, because you're in the book of Numbers, your desire has sort of waned a bit. Instead, uh, you have a new gadget for your computer. The first thing you do when you get up, instead of being at the Bible reading it, you've gone to the computer to play with the new gadget you have. And so before you know it, Bible reading is put to the side while you pursue other but lesser interests. Why? What has happened? You may very well be experiencing precisely what the Apostle Paul describes in Romans 7 when he says, I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can you see what has happened? Indwelling sin, catering to the lower desires of the flesh, becomes an obstruction to the desire for the spiritual good the redeemed heart wants to do. And our text adds another dimension to the obstructing forces that block desire. It lists sinful motivations. It lists attitudes. It lists actions in verse 1. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and, and all slander. And these things are the opposite of the love that we are to have for one another, aren't they? Look at them again. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. And Peter had just commanded up in chapter 1 and verse 22, listen, have, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again, not of imperishable, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. So Peter just commanded to love, but these very sins and actions or attitudes and motivations are the opposite of that love, aren't they? 
And so therefore, if you do not put these sins away, Peter basically says, because we're looking for a connection between the obstruction to desire and the command to have the desire, if you do not put away these sins, you continue then in the opposite direction of the desire our text is telling us to have. If you do not repent of the sins that are against loving the brethren, and then you continue in a direction that's in the opposite direction of the desire that Peter is saying we are to have. You follow that? So in addition then to the flesh, and in addition to the sinful attitudes and actions of verse 1, the world that opposes God entices us and lures the Christian away from desiring the spiritual good. The world is designed to do that. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the deceitful pride of life. All the things that make up the world system that opposes God is designed to lure others away from God and believers also away from God and especially our fellowship and communion with God through his word. Satan is clearly behind all of this as he seduces the believer away from God's best by offering the passing pleasures found in this world. And so our text then becomes a kind of caution about the fact that there are spiritual entities that militate against and obstruct desire. As we look at our text... We should understand what the apostle is actually exhorting us to do. He isn't really just simply saying, have a desire. He actually is going further than that. He unfolds for us the intensity of the desire we are to have in verse 2. He says, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk, the pure spiritual milk. This speaks to the intensity of the desire that we are to have. Like newborn infants, which cry out for their mother's milk as though there may never be another feeding, so too are Christians to cry out for the pure spiritual milk. We are to long for it, Peter says. Long for equals strongly desire equals crave equals have a passion for. MacArthur says, as newborns cry for milk directly corresponds to its greatest needs, so the Christian is to strongly desire that which corresponds to his greatest need. When Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says afterwards he hungered. He strongly desired food after the 40 days of fasting. And at that very moment, that desire for food became the battlefield for the devil's temptation for him to turn the stones into bread. It is that kind of desire that Peter is talking about, this kind of strong craving, strong desire, longing for, is what he's commanding. But for what? What are we to have a strong desire for? This is the question that we ask about in regard to the object of the desire. What is the object of the desire that we are to crave The ESV tells us that the object is for the pure spiritual milk. Other translations like the KJV or the King James or or the New American Standard supply us with the object more directly. The Christian is to crave, strongly desire, and long for the pure, sincere milk of the word of God. Why? Why? Well, let me state that again. Let me just state it again. The Christian is to crave, strongly desire, long for 
the pure or sincere milk of the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is what sustains our spiritual lives. And Jesus conveyed this idea when he was tempted in that temptation in the wilderness, when he was tempted to turn the stones into loaves of bread, he responded, you remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is God's design for man. What peril then the unsaved are in? They will feed their physical bodies with the best foods. They will exercise hours on end. They will do what they can to secure what end? To the end of which their mortal bodies will be sustained for a finite number of days, finite number of weeks, months, and years. But then they perish and die in their sin. The word of God, however, sustains the believer in this life and all the way to the presence of God. But not only does it sustain our life, the word of God, there are myriad benefits from the word of God that are beyond compare. First of all, the word of God is truth. Brothers and sisters, remember this. Truth is outside of you. And you're not going to find it in mainstream media. And you're not going to find it in the world's books. I'm talking about the spiritual realities and truths that are to be man's and understood by man. The word of God is truth. It is the source of what is true in life. It is the source of what is true about God, about ourselves, about salvation, and about the world in which we live. Take salvation, for example. The world will come up with all of its different ways in order to be saved. That is, in order to find deliverance from the trouble that they know they're in. Intuitively, they know that things are not right, that they are not right. And so they're seeking for some answer to their lostness and their soul's need. And the Bible gives the answer to that. And that answer is in repentance and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who do that have eternal life. So the Bible gives us the answers, true answers about God, ourselves, salvation, and the world. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17 and verse 17, sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. Another benefit from the word of God is the blessedness that accompanies the word of God, the blessedness that accompanies the word of God. In fact, Psalm 1 is really a summation overview psalm, which really basically tells you what the psalms are are like and what they're about. And listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God, and on God's law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by the river's water that brings forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. There's a blessedness that's a benefit that comes from the word of God. Along those same lines is the promise that you will prosper. Joshua 1.8. God tells Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make your way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We see in verse 3 of Psalm 1, in all that he does, he prospers. We're not talking about health, wealth, and, and um, 
prosperity gospel preaching here. We're not mainly focused on a material accumulation. Rather, I think the most important thing is the spiritual prosperity. And the spiritual prosperity is astounding. The better that we know the word, the more we know the God of the word. The better we know the word, the better we know the only God. The true God. The one who's made us. The word of God reveals the very will of God, which allows us with confidence to walk in this life according to his will. In other words, as as human beings, we are walking alongside of our God uh, rather than walking in opposition to God. Assurance of salvation that comes by the Spirit of God is grounded in the objective truth of the Word of God. All of 1 John is written to give us assurance of salvation. John says in chapter 5, verse 13 of his first letter, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. That you may know. That you may know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life right now? Do you know it? John says, I've written this entire book that you might know that. And therefore, the word of God presents the grounds for assurance that the spirit of God alone can work in our hearts. The word of God provides us, therefore, with stability as we walk in the truth in the midst of a world of lies. You want to know how to walk in a world that's perverted like ours, that's corrupt like ours, that's morally decadent like ours? The Word of God provides us with the way to walk and the stability that that produces in our lives. Ephesians 4, one of Elton's favorite books, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The Bible equips us for ministry and it equips us to minister to others. It enables us to disciple one another because we can give the very counsel of God to apply to given situations in people's lives. It provides us with the only true worldview. We see the world for what it really is through the eyes of God as revealed in the word of God. It therefore establishes for us the righteous standard that God is for a world that is utterly in rebellion and corrupt and a righteous standard for us to worship God. God has given his word to tell us how he wants to be worshipped. We can't just approach God any way we want to approach God. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth must worship in spirit of truth. And we can go on naming the benefits that come through the word of God. But it is then no wonder that Peter exhorts us to crave and and long for and strongly desire the word of God. Is there any reason for us to question why he's saying this? The word of God is to be the object of our desire And then notice this in verse 2, the objective of the desire, that by the word you may grow up to salvation, he says. Brothers and sisters, we know that salvation really is composed of three parts, justification, the beginning part, glorification, the end game part. But that whole middle section from the moment we're saved to the time we're glorified is called sanctification. So all three parts compose the one salvation that we have. We have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. We are being sanctified by the Spirit of God. We will be glorified in the presence of our God. This sanctification is what the Word of God is is working in us and why it is so important to us. It's God's purpose in our salvation to ultimately conform us to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. And God, through the spirit of God, works in us to do that through primarily through the instrument of the word of God. 
So if conformity to Christ's likeness is God's ultimate goal, that is, if holiness is God's ultimate goal and blamelessness and purity is God's ultimate goal for the believer, then we cooperate and participate in this work in sanctification by strongly desiring that which he delights to use in the process, the word of God. And finally, we have in verse 3 the impetus of the desire, long for the pure spiritual milk of the word, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed, here it is, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. The initial taste of the Lord's graciousness to us in our salvation then becomes the impetus to pursue more and more of his kindness, more and more of his graciousness through the word of God. Brothers and sisters, do not, do you not remember, do you not remember, think, do you not remember the gracious kindness of the Lord when you first recognized that you believed? When by the grace of God he drew you to himself and you tasted his sweetness in the forgiveness of all of your offenses against God, when he granted to you the repentance and faith to believe, did you not taste then the Lord is good? Oh, we deserve eternal hell. And he has given grace that we might be saved and be able to stand in the very presence of God through the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So if we've tasted that the Lord is good, why then would we give up the pursuit of his fellowship for so many lesser desires? Why would we not strongly desire him through his word? And that's the command in our text. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up to salvation. I said at the very beginning that this text is basic or fundamental to our Christian life. But I also said that it was very challenging. Why is it challenging? It is challenging because it commands desire, and not just desire, but it commands a strong desire. And so because of that, many groan. See if you're here. I know I am to desire the word of God. I know I am. I want to desire the word of God but I just don't strongly desire the word of God. At least, not like I should. Are you there? How can we then strongly desire? And with that question, the reason why this command in our text is so challenging really comes to the surface. We are commanded to do something that left to ourselves we simply cannot do. You hear that? Left to ourselves, we can't do it. You do not have the willpower to do it. Your willpower will be like gravity pulling on an airplane that has run out of fuel. It will bring that soaring plane to the ground. Willpower and determination will not. Your dependence is on yourself, and yourself will let you down. In other words, you simply cannot wave your hand and desire him through the word. You can't do it. I can't do it. You can't say the desire come forth like Jesus did with Lazarus at the tomb and Lazarus came forth. You can't do it. So how do we obey what the text commands? 
First, we must seek outside ourselves enablement. We must seek outside of ourselves enablement. By the way, this applies to any spiritual discipline that we're commanded to do. We're to desire these things, but we need to look outside of ourselves for enablement. We know that God wants us to strongly desire the word. He's telling us that here in verse 2. Strongly desire this pure spiritual milk. We know that's what he wants. Therefore, it's kind of a command to look for enablement because we know we can't. You try it. That's what happens with the resolve to read through the Bible in a given year and come to the book of Leviticus and Numbers or get over to Hebrews or whatever and you find yourself not reading any further, picking up lesser desires. So left to ourselves, we cannot command desire in us to come forth. We need enablement. This inability, this inability does not mean that we can throw in the towel. Well, if I can't do it, then I'm not even going to try. Nor does it mean that our inability can be put on our God as the blame. Lord, if I don't have the ability, it's your fault. And therefore, I'm not going to try. Or therefore, it's useless for me to try. In other words, I cannot excuse my inability and ignore the command at the same time. We're commanded by God to do these things. So we apply ourselves in faith to the spiritual disciplines. We, we cooperate with God's purposes, right? He wants us to strongly desire the pure milk of the word. So I'm going to apply myself, yes, all the while seeking enablement from whom? From the only one who can give it. We seek our enablement from God. God, and when we get it, we recognize that why we are able to read the Bible through in a year is a gift from God, not pure determination of our own. And who is glorified by that? God. He enables, and we look to him to enable What if it doesn't come right away? We keep applying ourselves. We keep trusting him. And we keep looking to him in prayer to enable and grant what he's commanding. And our dependence being focused on God, he gets every bit of the glory for what is accomplished in our lives. And when someone asks you, how did you do that? The answer is quite simple. I know I couldn't. It had to be God. And guess who's glorified? It's not you. It's the God who gave the gift. May this text be A catalyst for us this year, not just the rip, not look, not just simply reading the Bible and but hearing it and and everything that goes with it. But all the things, worship, prayer meetings. You just don't know my life. No, but God does. And he's the one that enables. I think how easy it must have been for the Apostle Paul to be stoned and left for dead and get up the next day and go on to Jerusalem as usual. It must have been easy. 
No antibiotics, nothing to care for him at that point except what, Pete, what Luke gave him. Aspirin or whatever. But the supernatural power of God to enable him. Brothers and sisters, this is the way to live the Christian life. The world doesn't have it out there. It doesn't. It doesn't. All the pleasures that you can seek that are temporal, they do not do what the word of God will do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless it, we pray, Lord. Accomplish what you desire to accomplish through it in our hearts today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Reflect on